and it tells me it's going live. You're live. Well, thank you again for being here this evening. And feel free if you have some questions, you can ask them as we're going along to clarify things. But tonight we'll be talking about what is protein. So that will answer your question. What are some of the really good sources of protein? And what are some of the newer proteins that are out there? There's some new needs, honestly, like cell-based needs that uh, are just beginning to be developed and hitting the market. And also uh, another thing that's a little bit new is protein recommendations. Uh, the 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight, which is the typical recommendation, is being under consideration and with newer research, looking at increasing that to 1 to 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. And that has to do with our increased needs for protein as we get older. Uh, so I think that that is an important thing to also consider. We'll be looking at what are complete sources of protein, what are incomplete sources, and some of the overall functions of protein. We'll also discuss um, some of the information that you might find about protein and weight loss. Does it help with appetite control, uh, protein and bone health, and protein related to preserving muscle? So, okay, and I'm able to get you and the screen actually. So, so. Um, okay. We talked about some of these protein issues, um, and as far as macronutrients are concerned, protein is one of the most important. If you think about it. You could have a diet that was very low in carbohydrate, or it could be very low in fat. But if it was very low in protein, you would not be able to survive. So protein really is the primary nutrient to include in your diet, something that really needs a little more focus in your diet. You can go ahead, Courtney. Thank you. Um, and another thing that I just want to say about the macronutrient sources. Food is not just one thing. You know, it's not just like people say, well, I'm cutting out carbs or I'm cutting out fat. But typically, food isn't just one thing. It's not just carbohydrate. It's not just fat. For example, milk would be carbohydrate and protein, or um, a piece of meat would be protein and fat, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of kind of overlapping with these. Uh, macronutrient sources. So I know that you can't see this very well, but protein is needed in so many functions in the body, from hemoglobin to enzymes to antibodies to parts of the muscle. Um, it's also a messenger. It comprises you know, our hair, our nails. So from the top to the bottom and inside and out, proteins are very important. Um, and as I mentioned before, you would, unless you had kidney disease where you really have to limit protein, um, a low protein diet is not you know, um, typically a healthy diet. So um, protein can be found in animal sources such as beef, poultry, fish, eggs, and also vegetable sources, plant sources, like nuts, seeds, beans, lentils. Those are all primary sources of protein in the diet. And they all have different characteristics. You know, food is um, the whole package deal. For example, uh, some, of the, um, some of the sources of protein that come from plants are going to have antioxidants and vitamins and minerals that you wouldn't necessarily find in the sources of protein that come from animals. And 
in different types of fats you'll find in uh, animal sources of protein. So they're all a little bit different. We'll talk about what to look for on food labels and what you might be uh, considering when you make those food choices. So we can go ahead. So thankfully in our country, we don't need to look very far to find adequate amounts of protein. Um, even though recommendations are going up as far as protein, for the most part, we have sufficient protein. In fact, we actually have a little bit more than what we might actually need if it was spread out evenly to go to the party. But in other parts of the world where uh, underdeveloped countries have very uh, limited sources of protein, they don't have the complete proteins. And even if people are able to get enough calories, if they don't get enough protein, that is not sufficient for them to grow and to develop normally. You see, in actually millions of children throughout the world are at risk for protein and calorie malnutrition. And the swollen bellies that you see, that the uh, abdomen that is swollen, that's due to the fact that protein supplies um, substances that help with the fluid balance specific proteins and if they are not in good supply the fluid collects in places and creates the ascites and edema that you normally uh, shouldn't have so we can go ahead but that's not to say that within our community within our population there are people who are at risk for protein deficiency for example um, a, a pretty substantial percentage of people who are admitted to the hospital uh, with an illness have already suffered a loss of protein as far as their usual intake is concerned. So that puts them at greater risk right from the get-go to recover from surgery, to heal from wounds, to make it through a hospitalization in a timely kind of way. So that's one of the things as a dietitian works in a hospital setting that's one of the things that we are involved in in screening people when they when they come into the hospital but um, in the community people who don't have an adequate food supply or who are cooking only for one or who are missing meals or who have poor teeth or uh, difficulty swallowing are all at risk for uh, protein deficiency. And along with that um, decreased intake, whether um, and decreased tolerance of certain of certain foods, anorexia, disordered eating, and so on. So lots of lots of things going on there. These are the normal requirements for protein for women 46 grams of protein a day and for men about 56 grams of protein and that correlates to 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight on average but as as we get older there's some good evidence that our bodies don't respond as well to taking up protein in the diet and incorporating it into muscle. So, would you agree? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and so having started out with a greater intake of protein gives you a better chance of preserving that as you're going through the years of your life. Protein loss can start as early as age 30 especially if you're not exercising, and it just exacerbates as the years go on. So it's not only taking in the protein, as, as we'll learn, it's about getting sufficient activity and resistance type of exercise and weight-bearing exercise that can help with that. So, we can that. so you can see movement of muscle, the myosin and um, the actin, contract muscle fibers, which uh, 
help you to be able to do activities of daily life, as you can see in the next slides. Um, so this increase to 1 to 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram has been shown in studies to be associated with less muscle loss. So having a little more protein in your diet really doesn't have a downside to it. It, it could really be of some help. Um, but again, it's more than diet. The strength training and the resistance exercise are also really important. Um, so, and I have a grandchild that can do this kind of stuff. <laughs> I knew I needed bigger weights when they could carry my weights or not. Um, so, just basic things like with carrying groceries or being able to get out of the car or lifting a small child or or getting out of a chair and sitting is now viewed as the new smoking as far as you know sitting for prolonged periods of time so we all need to be able to you know get up and, and move around a bit more um, but you know helping to prevent falls but starting with the shoes would be, <laughs> be the best place to go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, picking up things, being able to play with your kids or grandkids and do some of those things, engaging in some of your favorite activities. So it's all about that. It's not um, only the wound healing and the prevention of disease. It's being able to be more active and safer as you go through life. So, okay. So now we get into a little bit of the uh, biochemistry of it all. Um, so proteins are made up of smaller blocks called amino acids. Um, proteins, there's, and there's literally thousands of proteins, are all very unique. They contain different amounts of amino acids, and the amino acids can cross each other. They can be um, configured in different shapes. So we have kind of a three-dimensional type of thing. So it's so it's all very elegant how this is done in your body. There are 20 different amino acids. Um, and this is obviously pretty darn simplistic, my view of this, but they are linked together kind of like building blocks. And half of, well, a considerable number are non-essential. Um, and some are essential, but when you take in dietary protein, your body starts breaking it down in the stomach with um, hydrochloric acid and pepsin. And then the continued digestion goes on through the intestine where it's broken down into shorter chains of protein. And eventually you get to these amino acids. So there's, there's 20 of them all together. Um, the essential ones and are on the left-hand side and the non-essential on the right. That word, well, they're all really essential, but in this case, the definition of essential means that your body needs to get them from an outside source. Your body cannot create them. So they're kind of like how vitamins are. You know, you have to take in essential amino acids. And you were mentioning uh, the quinoa. So quinoa is one of the few plant sources that are a complete protein, meaning they have all of the essential amino acids. So good choice. And the soy is soy is the same way. So happy with your soy. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah. Did you want to? Yeah. No, that's okay. good. Good point. Um, so the non-essential amino acids your body is able to make from what is available already and put that together. So when your body needs a particular protein, you know, it sends a message out and they start gathering the ingredients, kind of like how we would make oatmeal cookies, you know, putting all the ingredients together. But if you are missing an essential amino acid, that would be like, for example, missing oatmeal in your oatmeal. 
So, so you could make something, but you couldn't make, you know, oatmeal cookies. Just like if you were missing an essential amino acid, but your body would try to find that. So it might break down some muscle in order to actually put that together to have have the protein. But then you have that continual wasting that you see in, in protein deficiencies. So you can go on. Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to show you this because it depicts one way of, or one particular protein and how it's all linked together. So this is this is human insulin. It's 51 amino acids. Mm -hmm. They're linked together. You can see like phenylalanine and valine and um, uh, cysteine and tyrosine. And, you know they're they're all kind of linked together. Um, we could. So human insulin is really interesting in that it was um, discovered about a hundred years ago, like in 19, 1922. Um, but it was it was the first protein that they were able to fully sequence and really show where all those amino acids were. Not only that, it was the first protein to be chemically synthesized in the laboratory. Before that time, they used to get it from animal sources, and that's what people took as injections for insulin. Mm -hmm. And even though they could synthesize it in a laboratory, um, they couldn't make very much of it. So so people still relied on animal sources and, and other less kind of pure, well-defined. We were kind of lucky in a way that some of these animal sources of insulin were so close to human insulin, you know? Um, but then in 1978, it actually um, was the first human protein to be manufactured through biotechnology. So this was very interesting how they took the gene for human insulin and it was inserted into bacterial DNA. And then the bacteria became this kind of little factory to produce more and more insulin. And then they were able to in later years, like in the 1990s, do other things with this molecule to change how it worked in the body of people who have to take insulin. And one of the reasons I bring this up is we now have, uh, you know, capability of making meat from individual cells. And some of this reminds me of that. It's that kind of, um, you know, highly technical, scientific, biotechnology that's driving many parts of our life, including food sources, too. So we can go on. Um, so by definition, complete proteins are all of the essential amino acids. So an animal, so a protein from an animal has all of the essential amino acids. Um, and the only uh, plant sources would be soybeans and quinoa that would have all the essential amino acids. Uh, okay, the old advice was that, yeah, Nancy, you might remember this about combining mm -hmm. amino acids mm -hmm. when in school, when they talk about having, you know, one from a grain and one from like a bean and they were, um, and then they would make up a complete protein. But now, as long as you're eating plenty of protein, uh, you can you don't have to worry about having incomplete proteins at the same time. That used to be a really big deal. Wait, not for how long ago. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So just, uh, I just wanted to mention this in terms of evaluating proteins. The scientists have uh, a number of different tests that they use. And right now the current one is from 1989. It's, this is a mouthful. Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score. And they can look at proteins and just really see, okay, they have all the essential amino acids, but are they in the right proportion or are they in the best proportion? And so something like an egg is uh, like ideal, like oh, it's so perfect, you know? So your body can use it very, very efficiently. But this is more for people who really get into evaluating this. We don't need to. <laughs> I just wanted to mention. 
But protein is really everywhere in the news. It's everywhere in food labeling. Um, so we can go ahead, pardon me. Um, and as I mentioned before, in terms of just the, the basic needs, we're actually doing pretty good with foods that have a fair amount of protein, like beans, eggs, and nuts. So it's not that our um, intake of protein necessarily is insufficient. It's it's just that some people are at more risk and not really getting enough protein, and other people are eating a lot of protein. Mm -hmm. So it's not always balanced out. You can um, and it's kind of interesting too to see how our tastes have, have changed a little bit. Like if you look at the red line, um, beef consumption went way up in the uh, seventies and eighties, and then you know came back came back down again. So it. And chicken is, wow, look at that. I mean, this graph ends in 2013, but still, you can see that you know, increasing. And um, I wanted to show you this, too, because it shows that the proportions that we eat in the diet have not changed hugely, but our calories have changed a lot. You know, so in 1970, the, the average person was eating, you know, 2,077 calories, and then in 1990, um, 2,343, and then, um, you know, almost 2,600 in 2010. So, so sometimes you read about, um, I guess this is a pet peeve of mine as a dietitian. <laughs> you read about. Everybody got heavy because we encouraged carbohydrates. Wow, well, that's not exactly true. You know, we encouraged a balance of things, but people took it as, let's just eat more. Let's keep, you know. And so, um, so I think, you know, the weight issues became more prominent because of more calories from, from a lot, you know, a lot of sources. So, okay. but here you can see, um, the grams of protein in different types of foods, starting with beef and going through the Greek yogurt, you can see what it is for an egg. And then when you get down to the cereals and grains and vegetables, smaller amounts, but they still make a contribution to the diet. So one of the one of the recommendations is to try to get about five to seven ounces of protein in your diet. An egg would be a substitute for an ounce of meat. Um, there are you know, substitutes as far as beans or lentils or split peas as far as meeting those, those protein needs. In fact, I think I have a note over there about, uh, about meeting those guidelines. So without having to, to actually count grams of protein, that would be, that would be one way to, to look at that. Um, and these are some of the top uh, non-animal protein sources, which can supply really pretty substantial amounts of protein. So you know, it's tempting really? first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we got yeah. where, where, where does wild rice fit into that? It's well, pretty close to quinoa, isn't it? It's, it's still considered um, a, a more of a, a plant source that isn't necessarily a high protein source. It's, well, it's protein compared favorably to quinoa. It's yeah. about the same, about five yeah. grams yeah. per serving. But I'm just wondering, is it a complete protein? No, okay. no, no. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so lot, lots of options. Um, and one is the, this should really be the new plants meat because that's what it is um, so in the in the plant sources there's a lot of use of, of soy and there's some use of gluten as sources of protein but I think the difference with with it is in this kind of newer beyond meat product they've tried to make it appeal more to people who want something that's more like meat so it has the texture of meat, and it even has some of the bloodiness of meat. I've read that. So, 
So yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it's from beet juice or what. <laughs> uh, so and this comes in you know lots of lots of different forms. So this is one of the one of the newer ones. But again, it's it's a it's a plant based one. It's not a not a cell one. Um, okay, go ahead. Did I go too fast? No. no? That was okay. Fine. No, that was fine. So guidelines in selecting, you know, look at the label. If you're replacing it for beef, chicken, or fish, aim for at least 10 grams of protein. And 20 would be, I think, better, to tell you the truth. Um, many of those products are pretty high in sodium. For example, if you had three ounces of chicken or three ounces of roast beef, the sodium level would be maybe 80 or 90 milligrams of sodium. But these, in that amount, have like 350 is not unusual. So, you know, if you're really watching your sodium, it starts to add up, you know, um, and look for heart healthy sources of fat rather than saturated fat sources. Um, corn was something that came up when I was doing the research on this. This was introduced um, in the U.S. not so many years ago. It's a it's a microprotein that's based on a, on a fungus. And in the initial labeling, it compared it more to mushrooms and it gave people the impression that it was related more directly to mushrooms. And so the Center for Science and the Public Interest petitioned the FDA and said that the labeling needed to be changed because there were apparently some severe allergic reactions. You don't hear very much about it right now, but and it is and it is produced in um, you know in um, very sanitary ways, but it, it just was one of those things that um, was was confusing to the public in terms of how this how this label. So that might be something that you want to check on, you know, if you're and these have been around for a while. I mean, Boca burgers have been around since 1979. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a while. So they're you know they're based on on soy. So they're a complete protein source. Um, and then you have you know more of the um, garden vegetable patties, which are listed as, as a good source of protein. Um, and in the, I was gonna say also also in the garden burgers, it's a soy, there's a soy protein concentrate. So they have, um, you know, a good complete source of protein. Thank you. So tofu, uh, that is made from curdling soy milk from soybeans and then pressing the resulting curds into soft white blocks. And the amount of protein in tofu differs a little bit depending on the water in it, whether it goes from, you know, a very soft kind of silky all the way to the, to the firm. But one of the reasons why people veer toward these particular foods is to decrease the energy use that it costs to, to produce animal protein and some of the pollution. So that's another, you know, another kind of advantage of incorporating some of these protein sources. So can go on. Um, so tofu in three and a half ounces, it has eight grams of protein. That's a bit lower. Like if you think of an ounce of meat, it has seven grams of protein. So you have to have three and a half ounces of tofu to get eight. It's a good source of um, Calcium, magnesium, selenium, manganese, um, and it contains all the essential amino acids. Uh, it's good for heart health, bone health. It could be an aid to weight loss. Some studies show that. So, and tempeh is more concentrated in protein, uh, four ounces with 21 grams of protein. And this is also a soy a soybean-based um, product, and it has um, 
kind of kind of a weedy, a weedy taste that makes it makes it appealing. Yeah. Um, it's a traditional Indonesian soy product made from fermented soybeans. It too has a similar nutrition profile as tofu does. It's a good source of protein, calcium, magnesium, manganese, and phosphorus. It's pretty versatile too. What do you make it for? I I have I'm an experimenter, so I've I'm always done. I've tried to make tempeh bacon and I've um, cubed it in um, you know, pan fried it and stir fried it, and I've I've made tempeh burgers and um, stroganoff. So it's it really is quite versatile. Um, Satan is uh, a gluten, a, gl a wheat gluten. It's uh, not a complete protein. It's a little bit low in lysine. But it it looks really different. Yeah. So, so those are just a few things that I got at the whole foods and so. And if you've ever seen in a the the international section, you'll often see a can of what's called mock duck. Oh, okay. And that is that's the same stuff but it's it really does have a texture very similar to poultry yeah so but but more nutritionals yes okay so it is a, a vegan substitute for meat it's made from wheat gluten and water um, it could have some soy or legumes added to it um, Three ounces has about 15 to 21 grams of protein. Um, it's it's kind of not that big of a deal that's low in lysine because if you're eating a varied diet, you should easily be able to get lysine from another source. It's just a little bit more of an interest. Um, oh, before I go on, I just wanted to say something about, um, I don't have a slide on it, but um, the cell-based protein. Um, there is a company in Silicon Valley that is working on this. They take a, a tissue biopsy from the animal, I'm not making this up, mm -hmm. and they put it in a petri dish and add nutrients to it and develop it as the muscle of the animal. So, voila, you could have chicken, Without feathers, without feet, but just chicken. So that's that's the next thing. Um, right now it's really pretty pretty darn expensive. Yeah. And it's created, you can only imagine what the controversy that's going on about it and entire industries that will be greatly affected should it. Um, have you ever wondered about the labels that have protein added to a lot of different food pieces? But obviously, this is a great marketing kind of thing. People, so it has a, a healthy label. You put protein on a label, and it's it's bound to sell. It, it, it helps. But it's also kind of deceiving. For example, with milk. <laughs> yeah, with milk. <laughs> Even a half a cup of milk is four grams of protein. That's over a third of the 11 grams total. Hello, General Mills. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. 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 And this is the new nutrition facts label. And you notice that there's not a percent daily value by protein. And that's because, um, well, they don't need to to have it, they assume that most Americans are going to be getting enough protein, so they don't need to know that percent daily value. But if there's a product that makes a claim that says it's high protein, um, then they have to put that on there. So the percent daily value 
there's 50 grams of protein in salt. Um, this is one of the healthy, healthy food recommendations from the 2015 to 2020 guidelines. It's to limit calories from added sugars and saturated fat and to reduce sodium intake. So when you're making protein choices, like if you look at like on the left, the burgers, the ice cream, the pizza, somebody had pizzas there. Yeah. All right. Yeah. High protein. Well, High protein. Yeah. So it's right there. Yeah. He makes a lot of vegetarian. Pizza. Yeah. Okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, um, so that you know that's that's always something to consider too. And then, yeah, pizzas. Like pizzas, are great food. It's a great source of nutrition. Um, you can look at you can look at the next slide. So, so having. Um, items with lots and lots of cheese. Um, cheese can be pretty high in saturated fat, or some, um, say, hot dogs, um, variety meats, lunch meats. You know, they have seven grams of protein per ounce, but they also have eight or nine or ten grams of fat, as opposed to chicken or fish. That would be significantly less. And so, if you're wanting to get adequate protein but not too many calories, you want to look at the, the amount of fat also, as far as that goes, and then the milk shakes. And then, um, does adding protein make a food more healthful? You know, it's like, these are cookies, <laughs> 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 um, and they still are, <laughs> um, or cupcakes, or ice cream sandwiches, even if you add protein to it. So, and they're not kind of free. That's another thing too, you know, protein has four calories per gram. So it's not free, but it's gotten such um, an elevated sense in our in our food culture that we kind of think of it as, as a free item. Um, so again, the protein and the calories that go along with some some of these different foods. Okay. We can go on. So, so the RDA was was interpreted in the beginning to meet more basic or minimal needs for healthy people. But if you're a person who's bodybuilding, or if you're a person who needs more protein because you need to heal a wound, or if, you know, as you're gradually getting older, your protein needs go up, you have to, you know, a person has to be aware of that. These were, these were really very basic, basic needs. And in fact, like in the hospital setting, when we're calculating out some of these protein needs, we almost never use 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram. It's, it's really too low for that, especially for that population. So someone who's had bariatric surgery, an elderly person who's at risk for that kind of muscle wasting, wounds, trauma, increased needs for healing. Uh, and then one of the questions that comes up is, is a higher protein diet more effective for weight loss? And in some studies it does. It's a mixed bag. Some studies show that it that it is a little better, but then when you look at things in the long term, it doesn't necessarily come out ahead in terms of weight loss. So it just depends. The other, the other thing too to look at with diet with diets for weight loss is on either extreme people tend to come back to the middle. Like if like if they start out and they want to see, okay, does a really low fat diet promote weight loss more or does a really low carb diet promote more weight loss? Usually by the end of the study, when people are in a free living population, they're all kind of, kind of coming back to the middle. Those kinds of diets can't be sustained very well. That's what, so just kind of interesting about manipulating some of those things. Uh, is there a downside to eating too much protein? Well, 
there, there can be. Like if it's displacing other things that you should have in your diet, like fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Um, most of us could eat more protein, except for people who have renal disease, then it's definitely a downside. Some of the things that used to be concerns regarding protein aren't as much now. Like they used to say, oh, the average person, it's hard on your kidneys. You don't see that too much anymore in the literature. And the same thing, it used to be if you had uh, too much protein, it would be um, bad for your bones. And the research doesn't bear that out, but they do make a point of, of emphasizing that you should have else, um, adequate calcium and adequate vitamin D if you have a little bit higher protein in your diet. So, okay. um, this is um, <clears throat> this is one example also of figuring out um, protein needs in a couple different ways you can go on. Um, so not only is there the RDA, there's another way called inhibitory. So this is the equations. I think the um, we can go on the app, the acceptable. Uh, macronutrient distribution range. So if you look at protein in that light, um, you know, and sometimes I'll see it like from 15% to 35% or even 10% to 35%, but in any case, 35% is kind of a high point of it. If you were, we can go to the next slide. If you were figuring out your range based on that, like this hypothetical person, who happens to be standing in front of you right now. Mm -hmm. So um, it would be 50 to 175 grams of protein. So it's really a big, a big range. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, I think I talked about this. We can move on. Um, is it better to distribute protein throughout the day? Um, the studies are kind of mixed on that, believe it or not. I thought it would just be automatic that it was better to distribute it, but not necessarily. Um, but I think in order to obtain sufficient daily daily intake of protein, it's probably better to distribute it because rather than trying to eat it all at, at one time. So, okay. So here we go. How would you improve this diet? Um, first of all, you can make a comment about this diet. Like, I could say, I eat this way sometimes. But what do you think? I think yogurt for breakfast instead of toast. Okay, so that would uh, that would put you up about 10 more grams of protein right there if you had a Greek yogurt. So that's good. Any, anybody else? Put some poached egg on the toast. Put some like poached egg on the poached toast. Egg on the toast. Very good. So that would bring out seven grams. I want some peanut butter on that banana. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tablespoon or so. Yeah. That would work. Okay. How about the chicken noodle soup? You know, we saw in one of the previous slides that that was canned soup is only about six grams of protein. So and lots of salt. And lots of salt. Yeah. Yeah. What, what did you say? I'm sorry. I, I just wish they wouldn't put so much soup. Oh, yeah, I agree. Because I, I, agree. I enjoy soup. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. Um, so, well, one thing with the chicken noodle soup, uh, you could add something else to it if you want to. I mean, something that would have protein. You could add some lentils or split beans or beans, or maybe you have some canned chicken available or some leftover. Um, you know, or you could make your own and just include all those things. That would. Um, you know, those are all very good suggestions. Um, how about this part? Celery <coughs> so with peanut. Oh yeah, there you go. Celery <laughs> <laughs> so with peanut. Then we be done. So you. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, better pizza. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. You better go down to Shannon Royce. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we should do, Hartley. I 
next time we'll have spinning all of us here. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you could, yeah, I mean, you could change up the snap a little bit if you don't really want to. Um, you could, um, you could have the milk be a higher protein milk. You could make milk with added dry milk powder or get a milk that was a little bit higher in protein. Um, yeah. You know, there's a few few other options there. You can walk on. So these I'm gonna conclude with um, some easy way of easy ways of, of adding protein. So an egg is great. You know, most people can eat at least one egg a day and it's cheap, it's very usable. Um, so have it for breakfast or have it as a snack. Make an omelet. If you're concerned about the cholesterol, you can have one whole egg plus an egg white or two, and that would be even more protein. You could add a serving of vegetables like diced peppers or mushrooms. Um, some other things that, that people might find helpful is just keeping canned fish on hand, like if, if you can't catch enough fish. <laughs> so tuna, salmon, herring, sardines, you know, they're, they're great and they can be used for a meal or, or a pretty easy snack as well. Um, adding, adding protein to a salad or soup at lunch, you can toss in chopped chicken or turkey or kidney beans or black beans or lentils or split peas. Yeah, you know, and that's something in our culture, we tend not to use beans and lentils and split peas very much. We really could use those more. So, um, you could have cottage cheese as a snack or part of the meal. Um, you could really change things up too if you wanted to. Um, have an egg. Otherwise, you could try something like a breakfast burrito type of thing that includes some protein. Um, yeah. You can go for parfait, you have that for breakfast as well. Or high protein pancakes, you know. Um, Korea pancakes, they're high in protein. And if you you know, want to include pancakes and have them be a little bit more dense in terms of the uh, protein content, that would be one way to do it. I'm sure you could figure out a way to do that from your own mix as well by adding some protein components. Um, you know, something like Fairlife milk, has more protein in it, has longer shelf life. You could make double strength milk with a non fat dry milk powder. You could do that too. Might be my last one. So, questions? Any, any comments? Anything that, well, gee, I came to hear such and such and you didn't talk about it. But anything? What do you think about adding whey to your diet? I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think. Way would be a, a nice addition to a diet. It's, um, but I would, you know, and I would have it with something else so you get more, um, you no know, more nutritional value. Like, mm -hmm. you know, have it with milk or with fruit or, you know, something like that incorporated. But I think I think it's an easy way of adding a complete protein. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So, better idea what does protein. fruit have protein? Fruit does not. Okay. Yeah. Fruit and vegetables are low. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, meat, poultry, fish, eggs, those are really good sources. And then beans and lentils and split peas, cheese, milk, those are also very good sources too. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how much protein does a can of Insure? Oh, it depends on what Insure you are using. Yeah, there's so many different ones that are out there. There's high protein Insure, Insure Mod, different. But um, on the average, about 20 grams. Is there room for that in somebody's diet that's oh, not in the hospital? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely a place for some of the um, uh, the, the supplements that, that are protein 
based, like the oral nutrition supplements. You could, that could be, um, you know, either as a, as a partial meal replacement or as a snack. And, and even beyond Ensure, there are, you know, others like Special K or Instant Breakfast. Any of those would work too. When I had braces and I would travel up here, I used to always bring some of those with because, you know, you have to brush your teeth. It's just, <laughs> you know, a pain. But, but I, think, I think they definitely, they definitely have a place. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll have these on the table over there. This is um, tofu turkey, and this is bacon, both made out of uh, plants. So I I thank you very much for your attention and thank you. your questions. It was it's great to chat with you. And uh, uh, Trey, you, you are out. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So again, I'm Trey from Physical Therapy, just down the hall. And, uh, thanks for having me today. And Mary, that was that was really helpful, informative. I hadn't thought much about protein and diet. <laughs> I just know that I like lots of protein myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about building muscle and uh, um, as a physical therapist we help people do that uh, people that are injured but we also help counsel people that are uh, trying to just overall improve their general fitness um, muscle mass uh, or lean muscle mass is a real important thing to have uh, as Mary mentioned strength getting out of a car playing with the kids or uh, doing things that we like to do skiing Doing those kinds of things, um, there are a lot of benefits to having uh, you know, more muscle mass, and it's more difficult as we age. Um, hormone levels do drop, and it is harder to maintain a muscle mass as we get older. It's also harder to maintain <coughs> bone density, and bone density is maintained, as we know, by um, weight-bearing activities um, and, and strengthening activities as well, and so. Um, by, by building up muscle um, strength and mass, we're also building the bone mass because the bones have to respond by getting stronger as along with the muscles. So we're training muscles. So a lot of benefits to, to building some muscle. Um, I'll talk a little bit about just some general principles and some specifics about uh, strength training um, to, in order to build muscle. And so um, I'll first talk about some equipment, and it can be very simple. Um, but two components that we consider when we're trying to build our muscles is the amount of resistance, as we consider that. And we also look for overloading the muscles. So that's important to overload a muscle in order to trigger the strengthening process. Um, minimal equipment is needed. You can use dumbbells, hand weights resistance bands, weight machines, or body weight and self-resistance motion. motions, uh, like what Charles Atlas um, did. That's what made him famous. And uh, when I looked at, I, I did, a, this is great to, to do some research for this presentation because I always thought, and I heard it first in PT school, that Charles Atlas got strong on isometric strengthening. Did anybody else heard that? Um, isometric means no motion. And so you know, the, the thought was that it was just pressing against the body uh, and not moving, but contracting the muscles vigorously. Well, as it turns out, he used isotonic strengthening with his own body. And so instead of just not moving, he would move through a range of motion against his own resistance. And so just a, I kind of geeked out on that, but it's fun to, fun to learn about that. Do um, that do we, yeah, do we do those kinds of exercises? We don't use the self isotonic uh, so much as we use a lot of isometric. Isometric strengthening is extremely safe. We use it to uh, rehab tendonitis 
because of tendonitis is more of a movement uh, inflammation generated by movement. And so we want to strengthen those muscles without the movement. So we nice and Usually it's against the wall. Or, but we do, we do some self-isometrics for the shoulder. Yeah. Um, next I'll talk about progressive overload. Um, in order to, um, I'll, I'll just read this here. The stress or load on the muscle must be greater than what the muscle is used to. So if you can picture what a muscle conversation might have, um, it might say, if this is how it's going to be and we don't want to fail, we better build ourselves back up stronger. So the muscles, uh, if we if we do an exercise or an activity that um, is is uncomfortable, so everyone's carrying something too long and have the arms burning, right? Um, well, that's the muscle fatiguing and failing, and it's actually the burning is from lactic acid building up in the muscle, and that's painful. Well, um, so what that does is sets up a process of our body building that muscle up stronger. It, it, it does that, but first it has to heal the muscle because there's micro trauma in the muscle. And so that triggers that strengthening process. Um, and so we need a recovery phase after we do the strengthening. Um, and that mu muscle is actually calling for the building blocks of the muscle fibers, which we put under are the proteins that make up the active myosin filaments in the muscle tissue itself. Um, and we, so the muscles pull that from the bloodstream. And so if we've got enough protein in our bloodstream after we've um, triggered the strengthening process, then the body's got what it needs to build that muscle up bigger. Bigger, stronger. And uh, it's really interesting because um, when a muscle gets bigger in response to training, it gets bigger in part because each muscle fiber gets bigger, but also probably um, a bigger component of that or bigger factor in that muscle size is the blood supply. So the blood vessels actually get bigger as well to feed that muscle tissue and to bring in glucose and uh, oxygen, all of that. And also the nerve input improves. Muscle memory in the brain is also enhanced. And so uh, one example of muscle memory that can cause us trouble is um, as a young person, if we're used to exercising uh, lifting and carrying heavy things, helping your buddy push a car out of the ditch. Um, if we get older and don't keep those muscles strong and our buddy or somebody gets in the ditch and we want to go help them, our body remembers how to do that. But the tissues aren't strong enough to handle that much force anymore. And that's a classic example of carrying an Achilles tendon. Um, we see that occasionally. And it happens when we're in our 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, and so that muscle memory is, it, it's usually extremely helpful. Um, that's that's a, an example of where it causes trouble sometimes. Next, I'll talk about program design in a strengthening program. And so in order to build muscle, then we need to strengthen, we need to do exercises or something that challenges our muscles that what makes them want to get stronger and bigger. And so I'll talk about intensity. And there are three different types of uh, strengthening um, uh, aspects that, that we can look for in what we want to do. And so if we want to make our muscles um, just get bigger, um, then, then and that's muscle hypertrophy, where it's, the muscle is getting bigger, um, then there's a, a kind of a formula that you would follow. And I'll just um, read this here. It's 65 to 85% of our one rep max um, in sets of 80 to 20 reps each. So what that means is a one rep max is how much weight could you lift with that motion only one time? And if you tried it a second time, your muscles wouldn't be able to do it. So that's what a one rep max means. And so... Um, if I could lift 50 pounds once, and then if I tried to lift it again and couldn't do it, 50 pounds would be my one rep max. 
And that's the amount that I would use then to calculate if I wanted to just get a bigger bicep, then uh, I would use uh, 65 to 85 percent of that. Um, and in my head, I'll throw out 35 pounds or something. And so I would do 35 pounds, eight to 20 reps each. So I would do it eight times and then take a break and you do your sets of three to six sets per session. And I'll talk about frequency later on. Um, but then looking for strength and power, so something more functional, I would say, than just having big muscles, um, you would uh, perform um, at an 85 to 100% one rep max um, and repeat that only one to four times. So obviously if you're lifting 100% of your max um, in this uh, high intensity training workout, you would just lift that one to four times um, and so on. If you're looking for endurance, for being able to work all day long, for example, or for four hours, um, you would use lower weights and more repetitions because the muscles remember that and they've got actual physical components to them uh, that get triggered when we train in different ways. And so if you want to train to go ski the Berkey, then you want to you know, do lots and lots of skis. You go for a long time and you, know, you, you, you take tens of thousands of strides to, to build your muscles up to be able to tolerate that activity. You can get as complicated as you like with your strengthening program with making um, plugging in varieties or variations of, of these different aspects. Um, and you can use combinations of the hypertrophy, strength, power, endurance, and recovery times. But the, the focus needs to be on progressively overloading, and I'll talk about that here. And you want to gradually increase the, the load. And so as the muscle gets stronger, you want to either add more weight or you want to do more repetitions. And that's what progressive overload means. You want to tax a muscle to its limit and then over the weeks and months as you continue to train, then you can lift more um, and, and get stronger that way. Uh, I'll talk about rest, picture, rest periods between sets, um, and then I'll talk about frequency after that. But as a general rule, uh, you, you can start out by resting as long between sets as you spent performing the exercise. And so if it took me 30 seconds to do these uh, exercises, then I'd want to rest for 30 seconds. Um, now, depending on what kind of intensity you're working at, that may not be enough. And so you want to listen to your body. Uh, if you have any nausea or lightheadedness, um, and you know that it's because, oh, I just worked too hard. And so uh, and if you sit for a minute and it recovers quickly, uh, then you can start back into your next set. Um, I will should have prefaced that um, to uh, though to say that it's a good idea to make sure you talk to your doctor about starting an exercise program, especially if it's going to be a higher intensity, to make sure that you don't have a condition that um, might preclude you from working at a high intensity level. If you have a, some heart problems, especially. Uh, just make sure you talk to your doctor about that. But if you don't uh, and you, you're working a little too hard, you just need to tone that down a little bit. Uh, if you're uh, uh, working for strength and power workouts, rest periods of three to five minutes between sets is needed. If you're doing the bodybuilding program, then 30 to 60 seconds is best. And so frequency, how often should we go to the gym or should we go in the backyard and move rocks? or uh, whatever it is. Uh, every two or three days is a good way to start, um, especially the first couple of weeks. Uh, anyone that's been to PT knows that we're not surprised when you get sore after working out, after exercising. Uh, that's a normal, that's part of the muscle um, strengthening process. We need to tear them down just a little bit. We create micro trauma. And then the body needs to heal that. And it takes 48 to 72 hours uh, for a good workout soreness to, to heal and for those muscles to heal. 
And while they're healing again, they're getting stronger because of that, that trigger that we, that we gave them. Now, having said that, two or three days is, is a good way to start, but you will see strength gains if you only exercise, if you only strengthen once a week. Not as fast as if you work out two or three times a week, but you still will once a week. So uh, next I'll give you a, an example of a workout. Uh, there are thousands, literally thousands of different types of workouts that you could do. Um, and if you have questions or just really apprehensive about getting started, uh, they do have some personal trainers that help people over at the YMCA. That's a good way to go. Another way to start would be to um, take one of the exercise classes at the YMCA. They've got some with resistance training there uh, that would be really good. The people there are uh, well trained um, and can help watch out for, for training errors that might cause an injury because um, you don't want to have to come and see us. <laughs> so a total body workout is that there are different types of workouts. You can work out isolating each muscle, which is pretty high tech. Yeah. Um, and yet you have to have a good understanding of the anatomy to do that, but that's what the bodybuilders do. And, um, and the, the real high level uh, weightlifters will do that. They'll target each muscle. But um, a total body workout is great. Great for beginners. It uses compound exercises, and you should do that three times a week. Twice is okay. Um, and even once a week is better than none. But um, a typical uh, full body workout would include, uh, and I listed six exercises on the, on the little sheet here. Um, and this, uh, I'll just describe each one a little bit. But a bench press is where you lie on your back and you press the barbell up and away. And so that doesn't target just one muscle group, but it targets a couple. So you get mainly the pectoralis, chest muscles, and then also the triceps. Um, the next one is rowing, and so that's the opposite of bench pressing. That's where you're pulling. And this is critical. This point is really, really important because I spend a lot of my time treating people that have been training only one set of muscle groups, and it causes an imbalance. Um, doing only bench press and not rowing makes you stand like this sometimes. And so um, we really need to train the opposites. Um, <clears throat> shoulder press, and so that's uh, on either an inclined bench or sitting in a chair, and you press overhead. That works shoulders, uh, triceps, neck muscles. And then there's squats where you can hold a bar, a weight, or you can just hold a couple weights and just squat, or you can just squat with body weight. Body weight is plenty. If you've got any difficulty getting out of a chair, and you have to use the arms of the chair, don't pick up any weight, just use your body weight. And start with a high chair and just sit to the chair. If you have trouble getting out of a, of a low chair, just practice standing up and sitting down from a, a higher chair so that you can do your eight to 15 repetitions of that. And that's a wonderful exercise. A deadlift is where you bend over and pick up a heavy weight and, and pick it up. And then lat pulls is then where you pull down. And so that's the opposite motion of pulling up. And those you can perform one to five sets, uh, five to 12 repetitions of each with as much rest in between as you feel that you need. And then I talked just a little bit about the bodybuilder workout, um, targeting each body part. And then they target each body part once a week because they're going through all the, the muscle groups. And again, looking at opposing muscle groups, so getting the opposite muscles involved. Um, I'll hit just a little bit on the protein requirement for building muscle mass. Um, for building muscle mass and maintaining muscle mass through a positive muscle protein balance, an overall daily protein intake in the range of 1.4 to 2.0 grams per, kil per kilogram of body weight per day is sufficient for most exercising individuals. And so Mary talked about people as a, a standard um, population of people that want to maintain a, you know, a healthy, uh, fit body. Um, uh, but if you're exercising, 
you need more. And, um, and you will gain more muscle and more strength faster if you have more available. Because if your muscle is torn down and it's trying to repair, just like if there's a wound or any other injury, then we have higher protein requirements for that. Um, and so and, and that value falls in line with the acceptable macronutrient distribution range published by the Institute of Medicine for Protein. Um, I guess that my only parting thought was, and, and I mentioned this earlier, but make sure you check with your doctor if you have any concerns about whether you should start an exercise program and if you have any conditions that need special monitoring. And remember, remember the body in motion tends to stay in motion and the body at rest tends to stay at rest. <laughs> Do you like that or not? Um, we just have to keep moving. So, any questions? I was I was pleased to learn that increasing muscle mass and strength is not just a young person's gain. It's oh. not like you hit thirty five and what you've got is what you've got. Right. It's that there's there's even elderly people can increase their muscle mass and Definitely. get stronger. Definitely. So it, there's classes at the Y that are amazing that they retire like almost through the Y four times a week. <laughs> but I wasn't sure about with the, the weight lifting how often and you know and how much I don't want to hurt anything so I don't know how gradually to go up. How, how would you suggest right. that? Just stick to a certain certain weight. Because I do the strength, and then there's an active one where you get your cardio and weights, and then there's one that's just strength. Yes. And that one was today, but I'm never sure how much I should put on or use because I don't want it for anything. Exactly. <laughs> well, if you so if you want to gain strength from where you are now, mm -hmm. you need to dip into that discomfort. Level. You need to kind of max your muscles out, and you want to find that max point kind of gradually over a period of a couple of weeks. Um, and so, one rule of thumb is that that's pretty good. Uh, we talked about using uh, anywhere from eight repetitions to twenty repetitions in one of the programs. That's a good general fitness um, kind of a program. And so, if you can do twenty repetitions of whatever it is, and you don't feel much. Next time, increase the weight a little bit. If you're lifting 10 pounds, next time try 12 pounds. Yeah. And, and then see how you do two and three days after that. Because that's when you'll really find out. Because so I take the classes where there's a teacher there, which is wonderful, because then I don't have to think of what I'm, you know. Yes. Each. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Yes. Yes. It's just, it's been really good for, and then the, there's the silver sneakers too, for. There's so many elderly just getting in and out of cars or taking off their coats to different things, you know, the exercise that just keeps you going. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Very good questions. Okay. Any questions. I've got some PT exercises right now that are were given to me as um, to do them to fatigue. And that sounds different from what you're laying out here. That's right. So yeah. what is what's the difference between if you're recovering from an injury and doing some physical therapy yeah. exercises and this kind of a taking a body that doesn't have a, a real individual um, vocal injury and just generally trying to strengthen it? Yeah, good question. Um, when when there's an injury or pathology, those muscles around that area won't be able to perform up to their max level. So. Um, they'll they'll fatigue much more quickly than a normally functioning um, part would. Say it's your elbow, you won't be able to, to to really fatigue that muscle. You won't be able to cause the micro trauma in the muscle <clears throat> that you would if it was working well, like you could on the other side. And so um, we take advantage of that in that it, it fatigues quickly, but then it also recovers quickly. And so then you can benefit from two a day or sometimes three a day, sometimes just once a day, but you don't have to wait two or three days. Now, when you get healed up to the point that you can, you get sore muscles a couple days later, um, 
then it's time to reduce your frequency. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm going through right now is recovering from an injury and doing doing weightlifting there. But I, my target is to get back to the weightlifting that I used to do, which was general all around all body. Um, and my age doesn't slow me down. I can be a lot stronger than I am. Um, so I'll just keep working on it. That's right. We, we can be. And when, you know, the, it, it's a real common misconception that as we get older, we can't build muscle or we can't get any stronger. You know, that's, that's not true. Not it, it's the same. So what builds muscle, as you've just learned, is a healing process, right? Because it's triggered by a trauma, micro trauma, and then the body heals that and makes it even bigger and better. Well, that's what our skin does when we get a cut, right? If we get a cut on our knuckle, the body heals that skin and, and heals it with a scar. But uh, it doesn't matter how old we are unless there's a real serious metabolic condition uh, or severe lack of nutrition, our, our, that's going to heal. And the muscles are no different than our skin. They heal. Tissues heal. And muscle gets stronger. So, yeah. Keep it up, Jay. <laughs> awesome. I'm quite a bit stronger than I was a couple of years ago. I got a long ways to go. Excellent. Long ways to go. How quickly do you go backwards if you don't, you know, keep keep it up? Or do you, you know, keep at it? Or you know, like I said, if there's an injury, if you're sick, or yeah, you go somewhere where you don't have that. Right. Yeah. If you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. That's um, right. What <laughs> there, there are a lot of different ways to look at that. Somebody that ends up in the hospital, uh, if somebody lays in a hospital bed for one day, it takes three days to get that, that energy and, and uh, strength and ability back. I, I always think too about the astronauts, all the muscle that <coughs> lost in space, you know. Right, and right. Because they, they were healthy, healthy people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And trying to exercise. Yeah. Even in moderate space. So yeah, I think I think one of the biggest um, shames with aging is that we learn how to work smarter, and so that we sit more, and we we dwindle because we're not as active. I'm not as active as I was when I was twenty or thirty, and if I was, I'd be in a lot better shape. Yeah, Trey, I really appreciated what you said about uh, bone density and muscle. That um, was just golden because, you know, I think the risk of having a fracture um, is so debilitating when you get older. And, uh, you know, maintaining strong bones is just so great. We really trust both of those. Our bodies are amazing machines, and if we maintain them well, they work just fine. Barring injuries and other problems, but yeah, the better we take care of them, the better they work. Any other questions? I was just in California and hiking with my two sisters. One's four years old, <coughs> one's two years younger, and. They couldn't keep up with me because I worked out and they sure. haven't. And it, it, it really makes a difference. Yeah. You've been able to maintain your Pardon? You've been able to maintain your physical right. ability well. Right. In, in so spite you, of having a knee replacement December third. Well wow. <laughs> I still yeah. like them. Wow. Boy, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you. You all for coming and very especially from Duluth and partly for Thank putting you. us on. This yeah. is, this is great. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.